Witnesses of the Unknown, Betty Ann Barney Hill. Today on Echoes Through Time, we immerse ourselves in the mysteries surrounding UFOs. Alleged extraterrestrial abductions continue to captivate humanity. Among these enigmas, one case stands out, leaving an indelible mark on the phenomenon's history, that of Betty and Barney Hill. An ordinary couple thrust into an extraordinary event that defies all human logic and understanding. Barney Hill, a postal worker committed to social justice, and his wife Betty, a dedicated social worker with the New Hampshire State Welfare Department, were respected and active pillars in their community. On September 19, 1961, this couple residents of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, embarked on a car journey that would prove to be a pivotal moment in their lives. After exploring the majestic Niagara Falls and enjoying the vibrant city of Montreal during their trip to Canada, they encountered something extraordinary on the lonely roads of New Hampshire's White Mountains during their journey back home. The couple spotted a light that initially resembled a shooting star, but upon closer observation, they realized it was an unidentified flying object in the night sky. What began as simple curiosity quickly turned into a terrifying experience when the object began to tail their car. December 19, 1961. Bonnie and I am driving home from Montreal. Saw a strange light in the sky. Would change direction, came in, started following us. In an area known as Indian Head, it came out over the highway, stopped in midair. And Bonnie got out with the binoculars in an attempt to identify this craft. You know, the old-fashioned straw hats that men used to wear? The flat crown and the brim? That's what it was shaped like. And then, along one side, it had a big, big picture window. And it was had uh, dividers in it. And as he's looking up at it, and he could see people standing in the windows looking down at him, and the craft began to descend, and he had the feeling they were trying to kidnap him. He ran back to the car, and was speeding down the highway to avoid capture. And then later, they were standing in the middle of the road, blocking our way. This is what we saw when the car motor stalled out. Following this, they heard a deafening roar and felt a sudden sensation of faintness. Upon regaining consciousness, they discovered they were 56 kilometers away from where they had stopped the vehicle, and to their surprise, their watches were not functioning. Disoriented and bewildered, they made their way back home. Upon returning home, Betty and Barney Hill began experiencing inexplicable emotional and physical disturbances. They decided to take long showers, to cleanse themselves of any potential contamination they might have been exposed to. Later on, they had the idea to create individual drawings of what they had witnessed, only to discover with amazement that their drawings were nearly identical. As they regained their composure, they noticed the absence of some of their belongings. Recurring nightmares, extreme anxiety, and overwhelming stress infiltrated their lives, deeply affecting their psychological and physical well-being. Betty was haunted by dreams in which she was subjected to medical experiments inside a spacecraft. After much deliberation, on September 21, 1961, she decided to contact the U.S. Air Force Base P's, though she withheld some details for fear of not being believed. The following day, Major Paul W. Henderson reached out to the Hills to conduct a more thorough interview. Armed with this information, Major Henderson submitted a report to Project Blue Book a UFO research project of the United States Air Force at that time. The investigation's conclusion, just five days later, was that the Hills had mistaken the planet Jupiter for something else. Faced with this, Betty resolved to conduct her own investigation. Her first step was to visit the library and gather a variety of books that could shed light on what had transpired. Among them, she found one written by Donald Kehoe, a retired member of the United States Marine Corps and a member of NICAP. 
a group of civilian ufologists dedicated to investigating reports of the UFO phenomenon. Betty wrote to Donald Kehoe and recounted the entire story, including all the details and the description of the humanoid figures. Her letter reached an astronomer from NICAP, and they met on October 21, 1961, for an interview that lasted six hours. During this meeting, Betty and Barney explained what happened in great detail, though they admitted to having blocked memories. On November 25, 1961, NICAP members interviewed Betty and Barney Hill again. During this session, they focused on the duration of the trip, which was initially planned for four hours but ended up lasting seven. To comprehend what transpired during those lost hours, on December 14, 1963, in Boston, the couple underwent hypnosis sessions with Dr. Benjamin Simon. What emerged from these sessions was a startling and chilling narrative. Under hypnosis, Betty Ann Barney described encounters with extraterrestrial beings, undergoing medical examinations and procedures that defied all human logic. The aliens were described as small, approximately five feet tall, with prominent round heads, large black eyes with no visible eyelids, barely perceptible noses and small mouths. They described the alien skin as grayish or yellowish, apparently devoid of facial hair or hair on their heads. They wore tight blue suits and uniforms made of a shiny synthetic material. According to Betty Ann Barney's accounts, the aliens seemed to communicate telepathically, transmitting messages and instructions directly to their minds. These hypnosis sessions were recorded for later review and possible recovery of more details. During these experiences, Betty claimed to have received messages and visions about the fate of humanity and the nature of the universe, delving even further into the mystery of her encounter with extraterrestrials. While Barney appeared nervous and terrified during the sessions, I try to maintain control so Betty cannot tell I am scared God, I'm scared. It's all right. You can go right on and experience it. It will not hurt you now. I got to get my gun. Oh! I got my gun! All right. All right, that's all. I got to get my gun! Go to sleep, Steve. You got to get now. Oh, no. You got to die. <laughs> Betty felt capable of recounting the experience relatively calmly. Dad, I go up the ramp, and I go inside, and there's a car to the left. Yeah, we go up the car to And there's the room, and they start to take me in the room. Some of the men come in the room with this man who speaks English and me, and they stay for a minute. I don't know who they are, I guess maybe they're the crew, but they only stay for a minute. And the man who speaks English is there, and another man comes in. I haven't seen him before. I think he's a doctor. And they, I see them at the door, and I think he's got, I don't know how our nervous system is, but I hope that we'll never have nerve enough to go around kidnapping people right off the highway, like he's done. And I, oh, he tells me to take off my dress, and 
And he used to tell me, take off my dress, and then before I have a, he would have a chair tightly to stand up to do it, the examiner. And I had my dress, had the zipper down the back. Although these sessions proved beneficial for the Hills, helping them assimilate what had happened and cease the nightmares, Dr. Simon did not place much credibility in the results, casting doubts on the veracity of the couple's experience. Despite this, the Hills felt relieved and emboldened to share their experience with friends and family. However, not everyone believed their words. Even Dr. Simon himself published an article expressing doubts about their account. In October 1965, the Hills' lives were peaceful. But on October 25th, their story exploded on the front page of the Boston Traveler with a controversial headline. John H. Luttrell had obtained an audio recording of a lecture by the Hills, along with audio tapes of their hypnosis sessions and confidential interview notes. The following day, on October 26, the United Press International News Agency took note of the story, taking it to an international level. In 1966, writer John G. Fuller, with the cooperation of the couple, wrote the book The Interrupted Journey about the case, including a copy of the star map, which became a bestseller. From then on, Betty became a celebrity in the UFO community, offering lectures worldwide. One of the most fascinating aspects of Betty Hill's experience was the revelation of a star map shown to her during her alleged abduction. In St. Louis, Missouri, Marjorie Fish, an amateur astronomer and ufologist, utilizing the information provided by Betty regarding the stars and their positions on the map, Marjorie created three-dimensional models of different star configurations in an attempt to find a match with the star system described by Betty. After creating numerous models, Marjorie concluded that the star map could represent the binary star system's Eta Reticuli, as described by Betty during her alleged abduction. This discovery heightened interest in the case of Betty and Barney Hill and sparked further debates about the authenticity of their encounter with extraterrestrials. The public's response to Betty Hill's star map was varied. Some viewed it as compelling evidence of her experience and solid proof of extraterrestrial life's existence. Others remained skeptical, suggesting that the map might have been influenced by the popular science fiction of the era, or created by her subconscious during the hypnosis sessions. In the years following the incident, Betty Ann Barney Hill underwent numerous interviews and additional hypnosis sessions, during which they continued to share details of their encounter with extraterrestrials. Books were written, and a movie was even made about their experience. However, as time passed, the couple opted to retreat from public scrutiny and lead a quieter, more private life. So the experience itself happened in 1961, but it was not known until a Boston newspaper reporter found out about it. And it ran for five days on the front pages of the Boston newspaper. I went on TV. I was questioned by F. Lee Bailey, and then I sat down and had lie detector testing in front of the whole country, and I had very, very high ratings for honesty and truthfulness. Ultimately, Betty Hill passed away on October 17, 2004, at the age of 85, while Barney Hill had previously died in 1969 at the age of 46 due to a stroke. Despite their passing, their legacy lives on through documents, journals, and other materials related to their experience, preserved at the University of New Hampshire, offering a captivating glimpse into one of the most infamous encounters between humanity and the unknown. The case of Betty and Barney Hill was among the first to receive widespread media attention and undergo exhaustive investigation by paranormal researchers and ufologists. This has contributed to its recognition as one of the most influential cases in popular culture and the public's understanding of close encounters with UFOs and extraterrestrial abductions. How did Betty manage to provide such a precise description of the Reticuli system? What are your thoughts on this intriguing case? <laughs>